And thank you also to Eric and Min. And who was the person from Engineers SG? Karen. Karen. Thank you. Karen. Uh, thank you, to Karen, for for joining us and helping us out today. At Talk JS or Virtual Talk JS. Oh. Okay, here's our timetable. We're going to have this short opening address by me, and then we will have the talks. And then uh, about 8.30, we will have, uh, uh, we will have uh, open mic, and it will probably deteriorate into just a chat. But we'll have an open mic session. Oh, I'll, I'll describe that later. Uh, oh, we have a code of conduct here. Please be respectful to uh, all the other participants and the uh, speakers and the organizers, everyone involved. If you have any problems with someone not being respectful, pr please feel free to contact uh, any of the organizers or uh, the engineers, SG people in confidence. Uh, if you are interested in speaking at a future meetup, you can come to our GitHub and uh, Singapore, Singapore JS slash talk .js. Under the issues, we have um, the info about the upcoming meetups, and that's where we arrange the speakers. So please come along to there. Should I show that? Yeah, here's the, here's the repository. Singapore JS Talk JS, and under the issues, we have uh, this month's this month's issue. Okay, uh, uh, this is where we arrange the speakers. So please come along here and submit your proposal if you're interested in speaking. Oh dear, I'm on the wrong tab. <laughs> okay. To find my way back. Okay. So now we'll talk about some of the community in Singapore. So we have engineers.sg who do the uh, recording, recording of all the meetups, and they also have uh, a list of upcoming events, which is quite useful. You can find out that URL. I'm going to try again. Yeah, here's the list of events. Uh, pretty good to see what's coming up. Um, and also, they have a list of videos up here. So you can watch uh, any anything you missed, you can watch again. Uh, then there's React Knowledgeable, and they have something coming up on Friday. Um, of course, they do React stuff. Uh, if you want to see what's coming up for them, I recommend you checking out their Twitter, because I think that is more up to date. So you can see um, you can see the link for the YouTube stream on their Twitter account. Um, Google are doing something in uh, next Tuesday. Um, it's going to be online. It's not going to be in their developer space. They're going to be talking about Firebase and Flutter. Uh, then we have Talk CSS. This is in two weeks from the 1st of July because they do the first Wednesday of every month. Um, they're going to be talking about Bezier curves. Uh, React JS. Is going to be coming a month from now, but you sh probably shouldn't go to them because it's the same day as us. So just forget about that. React is never mind. <laughs> uh, uh, and then uh, we have a Telegram channel if you're interested in joining to stay up to date on yeah on Telegram. Uh, it's called Singapore JS, as you can see. And there's also some other uh, interesting channels you might like to join. All called DevSG. 
Okay, tonight we have three interesting talks for you. Uh, one about baking in Vue.js by Crystal. Then we have something about uh, uh, an ex a Ruby developer who moved to JavaScript, uh, Wei Yuan. And then we're going to have um, optimizing in React from Akshata. Uh, and then after the presentations, we'll have our open mic session. So if you have anything you want to share with the community, uh, any interesting projects you found or interesting tools, something you're working on you want to share, or if you are looking for a job, or if you are trying to find some from it, someone for a job, and that will be in about an hour from now, hopefully. Um, okay. But now we're going to go straight into the talks. We're going to have about 25-minute talks. Um, maybe, yeah, about 25 minutes. And then we'll have five minutes question and answers before we go on to the next talk. Uh, yeah. So, Crystal. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Yeah. I'm disconnecting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, can everyone see my slides? Yes. I can see. Okay. Okay, so um, today my presentation is about Bread Talk, where I'll be talking about my experience of um, building an intuitive baking tool using the Vue.js technology. Yeah, so a little bit about me first. I'm currently an enterprise engineer at Facebook, and I have about close to five years of full stack engineering experience. And for my experience with JavaScript, it started with jQuery in my first company. Then I moved on to Angular 1, uh, Vue.js, and finally I'm doing React.js now in Facebook. And uh, baking is just one of my hobbies because I really enjoy the process and also the products that I get to eat. Yeah, okay. So um, so to let's get everyone started on the same foundation with some basic knowledge of baking bread. My love for baking bread actually comes from the fact that you need very simple ingredients. So we start, we basically only need flour, water, salt, and a leavening agent. So a leavening agent can be either yeast or you can use a sourdough starter, which is made from flour and water and then fermented over time. It's basically like a um, cultivation of natural yeast. And next is, uh, the second point is that you need minimal tools and this means that you don't have to clean up a lot. Technically, you can really just use your hands in a bowl and just knead your dough and just bake it on a tray in the oven. And across all the different types of bread that I've baked, I found that they have one governing method, which is to first knead and make your dough, um, go through one period of bulk fermentation to get the gluten structures in your bread ready. And finally, you shape your dough. And after shaping, for example, um, shaping means like you put it into some specific shape. Like you can see on my screen here, I created this like um, pig shaped bread for since this year was like the year of the pig. Yeah, so you shape it and you go through another final proof for about um, any time between 30 minutes to one hour, and finally you bake. So it's very simple, five steps. Yeah, but then again, uh, you will find that there are many ways that you can complicate bread too. Firstly, you can have enriched dough, in, which means in addition to the basic ingredients of flour, salt, and water, and yeast, you can add in other ingredients like eggs, milk, butter, and really make your bread really complicated to get different textures. And yeah, so I have discussed about the sourdough starter, um, trying to use a um, cultivated yeast instead of just active dry baker's yeast that is prepared to make the to make the bread rise faster. Yeah. And thirdly, we also have can uh, play with the hydration levels of the bread which means the percentage of water or liquids to the total amount of flour that you're using in your dough. And it really changes accordingly. So you can use like a mixture of milk and water, or you can, or it actually changes when you actually put in sourdough starter, since your sourdough starter itself is also a mixture of flour and water. And everything can get uh, really messy in a sense, because 
you can actually use baker's percentages where um, you find a percentage of ingredients in your dough and use it to create the dough and the texture that you want for your bread. So while uh, baking a lot during this circuit breaker period, right, I actually came across a few problems that I wish to solve. So firstly, is with the hydration levels. Uh, one problem I had is if I want a specific hydration level, say it's 85%, how much water should I use with regards to the flour in my dough? So it's really quite simple math where you just take, uh, so for example, you have 100 grams of flour, then 85% just means that you use 85 grams of water. And you, so because you are adding in a sourdough starter that has its own hydration as well, you will also need to account for that. Then secondly is with scaling recipes. A lot of recipes that I came across online, right, on YouTube or on blogs, they actually make very big portions. For example, they make like two 500 gram loaves. But for myself, because, you know, when you're staying at home, your family is, my family is not that big and we don't, eat a lot of bread. So I really just want to make a small like 300 gram loaves and it takes a lot of scaling of different uh, different ingredients while still keeping certain constants like the hydration level of the bread in order to get the size that I want. And finally, um, with limiting ingredients because I think a lot of people are baking, uh, baking during circuit breaker, right? So sometimes you have a shortage of ingredients at supermarkets. For example, you might have to substitute certain flours, or for, uh, you might want to create a Hokkaido milk bread, but you don't have enough built milk left, and you you still have the other ingredients. So how can I scale that loaf of bread down in order to use up what I already have at home? The primary uh, preliminary solution I had was of obviously to use Google Sheets. So um, in this case, you can see on columns E and F, I inputted the uh, the amount of ingredients that I need. And I basically use the formula to help me with the scaling and the hydration of the bread. But of course, that gets a bit tedious as well. And when you need to recalibrate different types of dough and so on. And then if we look back of what I talked about, the reason that I like baking bread was that it was meant to be easy. But now that we have so many factors coming in, right, it's no longer easy. And this is the solution that I came up with. So my idea was to build a very intuitive baking tool that uh, most uh, new, ba uh, new bakers can make use of. Because I know that during circuit breaker or uh, lockdown quarantine around the world, a lot of people are picking up baking and they might not have a lot of ideas on many of the, many of the um, principles governing bread. The two main features that I realized that were critical was one is the bread hydration control. So allowing you to change the hydration of your dough easily and helping to calculate the ratio of ingredients that you need. And secondly is to scale your recipes, maybe larger or smaller. Yeah. My idea was to also build a front end only single page app so that we can keep it lightweight and also means that I don't have to rent a server on say like an AWS back end server just for the calculations. And I could also leverage on GitHub pages to host my front end only single page app. And overall, because the like all these calculations seems like it is simple enough to uh, to be done on a front end only app. But of course, there are some drawbacks. For example, um, you can't really create an account to save, save your recipes and share with your friends. Yeah. So and that's why now I've decided that I would use Vue.js to make better bread. Yeah. So a little bit about Vue.js. So what I like about Vue.js is it has the HTML, JavaScript, and CSS all within the same file. So we we'll define like a view, view component, and within that view component JavaScript file, you have all your HTML, JS, and CSS. And I feel that this makes it a very good candidate when you want to quickly prototype without having for you to switch between files. Like I know for other um, JavaScript projects, you have to look through, for example, I'm changing the HTML on this file. Then I need to find a relevant JS file in another folder. And sometimes your project can get quite big with a lot of like uh, nested folders and it becomes quite hard to find those files. 
the good thing about Vue.js is that it comes with a very good um, command line interface, which allows you to set up the project easily with just a few um, keystrokes. And this setup is also inclusive of like any CSS frameworks you want to use, whether you want to use uh, any type of linting, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so um, yeah, finally, I've decided to use um, the Boma CSS framework and to use Font Awesome by Compact because it supports um, a lot of extensive styling, it's very modular and it's very responsive uh, and it supports responsive design which means that my, my app can be easily viewed on both mobile and web devices. So um, I'll go a little bit into the, the coding part now. Um, so a uh, disclaimer first, I don't, I don't, I'm not like an expert in Vue.js, but for q and I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. Yeah. So the component structure that I've thought up is first, I will have all the state management within the Vue.js store here. And the so-called uh, other in integral components would be first, we will have an in ingredient group. And this ingredient group would store multiple ingredients where these ingredients are being input by the user. So for example, one ingredient component can be the amount of flour that you want to use. The next one could be the amount of water that you want to input. Then similarly, you could have um, multiple ingredient groups. Uh, for this, I will talk about more about this in the demo later. And next, we would have two main tools, which are the main features of this um, bread uh, calculator. So we would have like a hydration modifier that allows users to easily modify the hydration of their bread dough. And we also have a recipe scaling tool. So to start off with, uh, I defined the ingredient model using uh, JS classes. I think it is available in ES6 and above. Yeah. So I created the ingredient model which contains a key. This key is generated using a unique ID using the uh, Lodash library. And it also stores the amount. So for example, the amount of grams of this uh, ingredient followed by the type of ingredient. Uh, the type of ingredient, for example, can be flour or can be liquids, can be your yeast or your salt. The name itself is more of like a description on the actual ingredient. So for example, if the ingredient type is flour, my name could be bread flour, cake flour, all-purpose flour. Yeah. And finally, the group is basically to point to the group component to show what this ingredient is grouped under. And of course, this ingredient model will come with getters and setters so that we can easily modify the ingredients. For example, uh, we want to modify the amount, then we will use the setter to set the amount. Yeah. So next is state management. Um, I'll touch a little bit about the Vuex store here. All of our state will actually be stored in the Vuex store. So I, I have an ingredient object here where basically we map the ID, uh, the key of the ingredient to the ingredient uh, model that we created in the previous slide. And the getters is a way for you to retrieve this data conveniently. For example, I can define a get all flower or, and get all liquids function. The get all flowers can basically help me filter out only the flowers that uh, are in my ingredients and similarly for liquid. So you will see that using just these two helper functions, I can now easily get the hydration of my bread, which is just the amount of liquid divided by the flour. And we also have mutations. What mutation does is to mutate the state of our store. So for example, setting ingredients will allow us to append new ingredients into the ingredients list. And to delete ingredients means that we will modify the state by removing ingredients from the list. And finally, we have actions as well. For example, to scale recipe. So actions will be uh, mainly what our components will call. For example, our recipe scaler tool will be calling this action to do some calculation and update all the ingredients on, in our list specifically. So moving in, uh, Vuex has something called computed values as well, where you can uh, define a function that does some kind of a simple calculation 
and you can actually use this uh, calculation on your HTML code to display that value without having to. Uh, so called when you uh, create this function, you have a variable that is constantly being updated when any of its dependencies changes. So then, which means, uh, so say like this amount, right, is the amount of ingredient I have, for example, the amount of water, and this is the total flour amount, I can easily create the baker's percentage here, which is just, oh, sorry, which is just the amount of that ingredient divided by the total flour. And this will allow me to easily calculate the percentage of every ingredient that I have in that list. Okay, and next, uh, another thing we can leverage on is with the use of our inputs for the computed values. So um, if you see here, right, when I talk about this uh, ingredient data dot amount, this is actually a computed value because it is reading it from the store. And for ViewX, we, we read values from the ViewX store as a computed value. But at the same time, we will also need an amount input in our data because this value can actually change. And how I handle this change is, for example, when the user sets a value here, I, I created this computed variable where I put in the model, which means that when the input, uh, when the user inputs a value in the HTML, we will call this set function. And what this set function does is it will set the amount input, uh, this variable, while calling a, a other functions here, which allows allows us to update the value. So. This handle update will then take the, the amount and set it back into the store. So this is actually an action that runs back into the store. So I think for this, uh, it is a little bit hard to understand just based on the code itself, which so I will, uh, when later on in the demo, I will discuss it on the, on the website itself. Okay, so uh, now moving on to the demo. Uh, yeah, so this is the tool that I've built. So on the left side, um, you will see that you can start adding ingredients here into your dough. So for example, if I add a flour, then I can add all purpose flour and I can state this to be 100 grams, for example. Then I can also go ahead and add some liquid. So this will be, and this will immediately calculate that my hydration level is 50% because it is 50 divided by 100. And similarly, I can add salt. So for example, 2 grams of salt would tell me that this is 2% of uh, with relation to my flour. And similarly, if you see that I, if I add multiple flour, for example, this multiple types of flour, then the hydration level will update accordingly. Yeah. And if I were to say I want a higher, a bread with a uh, bread dough with higher hydration, I can easily change this and it will modify this value for me to make sure that it reflects how much water I will need then. And going into the next part, we can actually add Levine. So Levine is basically our uh, mix of our sourdough, uh, sourdough starter that will go into our dough. So for Levine, this is uh, what I would say is another ingredient group. So the main dough itself is one ingredient group which contains a list of ingredients. And similarly, the Levine is another ingredient group which contains its own separate list of ingredients. So if I were to add this all in, yeah, so something like that, then you will realize that our hydration level is actually updated because of the amount of water that we have added in the Levine plus the amount of water that is uh, implicitly in our sourdough starter. Yeah, and similarly, we can set this back to 85%. Oh, okay. I need to, I probably need to fix the decimal places, but yeah. So um, then it will update the amount of water that we need, for example, to 80%. Yeah. And it will update this value here to reflect that, oh, now actually you only need 
percent of water with regards to your main dough. Yeah. And for the recipe scaling, you realize that we're able to scale by percentage. For example, if you want to make 1.5 times, then you can easily calculate and update all these values. If, say, you want to scale by a certain ingredient, for example, uh, you want to scale by the amount of uh, all-purpose flour. Say, the recipe asks for 150 grams, but you only have 100 grams. You can set this here, and it will make the change across to all the ingredients that you need. And similarly, for the if you want to scale by the total amount of flour that is in your main dough, in this case, which is the all-purpose and bread flour, we actually have 200 grams here. So you can update this, for example, you want to use 400 grams, you can update. So you would see that all-purpose plus bread flour is now 400 grams, and all the other values have changed as well. Yeah, so uh, back to the slides. Yeah, so um, I actually put this tool up on Reddit and uh, within an internal group within Facebook and uh, this was the reception. So there's actually about half of the users that are returning. So I, I guess that's a good sign. It means that people actually want to use the tool. And some of the feedback that I've gotten across both uh, platforms is that some of them wish to share recipes using simple simple things like URL parameter. So we can encode the URL parameter using the ingredients that we have, and we can share the recipe with our friends. And next is they wish to modify the percentages easily. For, for now, the only modifiable percentage is the hydration level, and you can't really modify the, the um, other percentages of ingredients. So the, the reason for that was I didn't really need that feature now, and that's why I haven't implemented it yet. And next is for our sourdough starter. Uh, I actually made the assumption that the hydration will be 100%, which means a 1 is to 1 ratio of flour to water. But there could be other uh, bakers that want more control over this. For example, their sourdough starter could be like a 110% hydration. Then, of course, the amount of water that in would be in our total bread dough would change, and we need to reflect that. Finally, there were also uh, some feedback that they want me, they want the tool to present the total dough weight, so they can see whether this dough actually fits in their bread basket for baking, or they want to know what is the amount of protein that is that dough that's in the dough. Because I don't know, some some people like to bake keto bread and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so um, that's all that I have for today. So um, yeah, now I'll have some time for Q and A. I have a suggestion, Crystal. Mm -hmm. uh, how about for beginners, you could put in a kind of limit. So if they put some percentages really badly, it could maybe show a warning saying, hey, your bread's going to be too dry or too sloppy or mm. it's not good. I think that price. was another um, feedback that I got, which was uh, usually the minimum amount of hydration for bread, it ranges from... 50% to maybe about 110% I've seen. So yeah, they were saying like some of the feedback I've gotten was to scale it down. And another thing that I've thought about was just to have a quick add button, which adds you a very basic bread recipe that you can then modify from. Yeah. There's been a couple of questions in the chat. One is, uh, can you show, share the URL for your app? Okay. Let me share that. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay, so... Uh, okay, there's one question about frameworks. 
uh, I think I would say that uh, it really depends on what you like as well. If you want to compare, say, Angular, React, and everything else. For me, I would say that Vue.js itself is very similar to Angular, but it is a lot more powerful and lightweight. Yeah. But then again, I've only used Angular one, so I cannot really vouch for the other versions. And for React, I would see, I, actually the part that I like about React is uh, that it is very object-oriented. So if you are someone who likes the object-oriented part of programming, like you want to define all your components as objects, then I would recommend, yes, go for React. Yeah. And for Vue.js, I would say it is very useful for quick prototyping of smaller apps. Yeah. OK. Um, For William's question on the uh, undo button, I think that's a good idea. Um, so uh, one way I can think of is to keep all the events within a stack and we can slowly undo it from the top of the stack. But uh, at the same time, maybe it is not that critical a feature because I would suppose that the ingredients you add can't be that much. Yeah, but maybe when you're referring to undo, you're talking more about when scaling recipes. For example, you scale it wrongly and you want to scale it back to what it was originally. Then, yes, I will agree that having an undo button uh, could be a good addition. Okay. For Sylvester's question, uh, how will you create preset percentages for the hydration levels? Uh, for this... I think of it more as a clamp than a preset. For example, now we have 0% to 120% or I don't think there's a, I set a max limit on that. Yeah, so it would be good if we can clamp it in a way instead of uh, specifically saying it is preset. Okay, and Alson's question, how do you find working with the BOMA framework? Okay, for that, uh, I would say that I haven't really tried a lot of CSS frameworks. Yeah, so the one that I've tried a long time ago in the past was Foundation. And Foundation was a uh, really entry-level CSS framework for me. Um, for Bulma, I really like it because they, one of the advantages is that they have a lot of helper classes you can assign. So it makes everything really modular. Like you can just turn a button to a certain color or invert the colors by adding specific helpers. And some of the helpers are also common across different components. So if you want to set like the button color, you can probably use the same helper class to set on your text and your backgrounds. Yeah. Okay, good to know that the current version of Angular is very OOP. Yeah, I haven't touched Angular for a long time. Do you think uh, React is still uh, object-oriented now that they're using hooks? Mm, maybe not so much anymore, but I do enjoy using the hooks a lot more. Yeah than the old style. But I think in comparison, I would say that it is still more object-oriented than Vue.js. OK. Mm. Interesting. I also like using the hooks. They feel a bit tidier. OK. Um, if there's no more questions, I will thank you very much, Crystal, for your, for your presentation. Okay, thank you. Oh, oh, before you go, sorry, how can people find you? Uh, uh, how should people contact you if they want to uh, ask? You can, you can find me on my GitHub, I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay. So next up, we have Wei Yuan. 
who's going to migrate from Ruby, uh, Ruby on Rails to Java, JavaScript. Um, Wei Yan, Wei Yan, are you ready to join? Yes. Yep. Let me okay. Start sharing my screen. You guys looks see good. Awesome. Yeah, looks great. Thanks very much. Backwards. All right. Uh, shall I start? Yes, please. Yes, go oh, ahead. Okay. <laughs> Hi guys, uh, my name is Wei Yuan. I'm a full stack engineer at Rakuten VT. Uh, so yeah, as you can see in the screen over here, the title of what I want to discuss today, or rather to share with you guys, is migrating from a Ruby on Rails application to Node.js. Uh, just to clarify, I think the title itself might be a bit ambiguous. Uh, I'm referring to migrating an application that we had maintained as a Rails application for actually a huge amount of years. I'll talk about that in a bit later. Uh, and actually looking at moving that to Node, uh, more specifically, we actually move it to uh, this framework, which is called Next.js. Uh, the content today, because the migration itself is rather big, so uh, I'll just want to focus itself on just the, the server side code, which is more Rails towards Node.js. And I think also to give an overview today on, you know, whether you should do a migration or maybe in some sense to also discourage you guys, you know, if, Let's say if you're thinking about migration, maybe this is something that will let you know, maybe you shouldn't go for migration instead. Uh, let's get started. Okay, so just as a very quick disclaimer, again, because the title itself, uh, it's kind of big. Uh, I just want to mention that the idea here is that it's not a silver bullet. Like, I'm not going to be presenting like a solution where you flip a switch, the Rails application turns into a Node application. Um, in fact, there was a, there's still a lot of work to do. I mean, we did a lot of work at the start. Right now, our entire team, in fact, I would say like 90% of the team is on, uh, 90, 80 to 90% of the team is on uh, doing this migration uh, currently right now, and we've done it for one year already. Uh, again, I'll give a bit more context into that later. And one important thing I want to stress over here is that I'm on neither camps, uh, not saying I support Rails more than Node. I do, I do love JavaScript more. It's easier to do create applications uh, using JavaScript frameworks. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it really depends on the use case. In our company, in Viki, in our organization, we do have use cases that where the Rails uh, stack itself suits uh, the use case better. In our case, we actually realized that, you know, what, at a certain point, the Rails application or the Rails stack itself worked quite well, but we have already moved on from there. Okay, so just to, I'll go a bit deeper on that as well. Uh, just to start off with the background before we did the entire migration, so we started our migration in 2019. So before uh, and on 2019 itself, the site, our main uh, flagship product for Viki it was run as a Ruby on Rails application. Uh, you can see over here, this is the first day, the first commit of the, that were found within the repository. So 2012, at the point when we migrated, that's around, I would say seven, close to eight years. Uh, in fact, the, uh, I mentioned that we migrate over to a uh, Node application with, uh, using Next.js. Uh, that's also, I think some of you might know, is heavily based on React. React came out a year after that. Uh, the first release was in 2013. So this was something that precedes that. I think Ruby on Rails itself was also released sometime in the early 2000s. So yeah, it's at that part of time, it was a mature framework that a lot of organizations and teams used. And to give a bit more context about the front end, uh, so server-side code, yeah, that's uh, definitely Ruby. On the client-side code, we actually started off with using a lot of CoffeeScript first. The idea for that, or the mentality was that we wanted to have a stack where, you know, your client-side code, uh, CoffeeScript, uh, server-side code in Ruby, both of them were very similar in syntax. So you had front-end engineers or full-stack engineers who can onboard the project very easily without having to uh, contact switch uh, so often. But as time passed, we had you know, efforts, engineers who came in, started exploring different things, started uh, looking at implementing React components within our application. So that caused a little bit of a mess. We had to actually look at importing these React components within our CoffeeScript code. Uh, and of course, can it never uh, get away from, let's say, the vanilla JavaScript that sometimes 
it's a necessary uh, necessary evil in some sense. You know, sometimes within some rendered views, you need to uh, put those scripts in for whatever reasons. Okay, so instead of jumping into the chunk of the problem, or rather, like today itself, I I'm not going to be showing so much code, uh, but I want to actually discuss a bit about the decision on whether you should migrate or not, and how we actually land up with the decision to do the migration. So, I mean, in some sense, if you are actually thinking about doing a migration, maybe this will help you know, push you towards or from uh, doing a migration. Okay, so as everything, you know, this is a big decision. A migration itself, we're looking at a seven to eight year old application that we are trying to move out. There's a lot of things to move out. So choosing a do migration is, uh, the solution for migration is a very big uh, issue. You know, it's something that you don't want to take lightly. And you need to apply some proper decision making on it. And I feel that like after looking back and how we made the decision, we kind of use something along the lines of the Kipling method. The Kipling method sounds like a very complicated thing, but actually it's something that most of us already know. I think if you're like in college, likely your teachers would have really drilled you with this met methodology when you are writing like some English essay. It's basically the 5W1H. Uh, but it's also quite effective towards uh, project management as well as decision making. So let's try to apply this methodology towards you know, breaking down this decision in identifying our problem statement and should we go for migration? Okay, so let's start off with a... Uh, okay, so just to break down into the common uh, 5W and 1H that I want to look at. Uh, so for one of our Ws, what essentially is... Uh, I want to focus on is what is our pain point? You know, before we talk about migration, what is the trigger that actually led us towards this path? And... Why should we exactly choose to do migration? I mean, you have your pain points. There are other ways around solving these problems. Maybe we should look at doing those things instead. Uh, so yeah, in fact, this part is about justifying. You know, if we want to do migration, the migration, why we have to do that, you know, instead of choosing some other decision. And the other three Ws, uh, in fact, that's something more within your own organization. So once you have decided the first few factors, who will do it, when you will do it, uh, where you're doing, I guess most, most of us would use GitHub, Bitbucket, or something along those lines. So uh, those are something you can answer within your own organization. Uh, and the last part, the hitch, would be the interesting part because this will be the bulk on what you'll be focusing on. In fact, what we have been focusing on over the this one uh, one last year, as well as you know in the following year to come. You know what we decided as our initial approach actually has sort of laid the groundwork on how this entire migration has been done. Uh, from this entire year and then the next year as well. Okay, so yeah, in fact, yeah, about planning your course of action. So let's touch on, on the first two Ws first. So what were the pain points that we experienced at Wiki and how that led us towards the solution of uh, migration? It's starting off with the pain points. So early on, I mentioned about the initial decisions that we made. You know, we have a, a Rails application we had coffee script for our client side code uh, and that was good because it helped to reduce the context switch but as time passed you know i mentioned that we had started adding react components so now you need to bundle your uh, transparent of some of your uh, react uh, files the jsx files together with your coffee script code uh, sometimes this also requires uh, adding you know certain values within some ruby file somewhere else and this started causing a lot of friction uh, somewhat here and there because sometimes people might forget to do some of these things. Uh, and then if you look at it, Ruby is very different from, definitely very different from uh, your writing uh, code in your React components. So what we had before, you know, that uh, small barrier or rather very little context switch was actually sort of working against us because now developers already sort of isolate the client side code versus server side code. You know, it's always two different things when they are looking at it. Okay, and that's our, the first point. Actually, I want to emphasize one more thing, which is that the first point itself is sort of related to a human-based problem. I think this one is kind of like my own personal uh, opinion, which is I think for any big problems that you want to solve, usually you want to see first if it's related to the human because the uh, developer happiness is so important. You know, that's something that you want to resolve. If all your developers are not happy with the current decision on how on your current stack and how you are running it. I mean, essentially, it's going to lead to a failure anyway. And I think one of the other things that we found out was this. You know, we had our Rails application. You know, we maintain it or we built on top of it for seven years. Uh, 
we started finding out that you know it wasn't the best environment for us to build a kick-ass front-end application. You know, we are talking about modern principles like having an isomorphic application, a single page application for optimizing performance. I mean, we, we did try out something along the lines of using PJAX uh, on some of our pages, but it wasn't scalable. You know, we could only do it on one single page. The code itself looks very messy. We couldn't move that, you know, ideology across. In fact, that was only on one single page. It wasn't across, uh, it wasn't rolled out across all our different views in the website. And I think one of the conscious points that, uh, points that we sort of came towards, realize, realizing towards was that you know, if you look at the initial first two points, it's, it's the damage that they can cause grows as, as the time passes. You know, if we choose to not to do, uh, if we choose not to do migration now, we do it three years later, you know, newer principles are going to come in place, newer ways of optimizing the front end, uh, uh, your client side code comes in. No, these are things that we might not be able to uh, do using our current framework. You know, we did attempt using uh, Webpack a few years before, but it, because of our CoffeeScript uh, code, we weren't able to make that transition fully. So because of difficulties like that, we decided, we were, I mean, we tried out a few solutions over the few years, uh, but we slowly realized that, yeah, migration seems like the only way to go. Okay, so explaining a little bit about why we end up with the uh, decision of doing the migration. Uh, the idea is this, the, previously I talked about the context switch uh, for between the Ruby code towards the CoffeeScript code. And we wanted to look at moving to a JavaScript application where, uh, as I mentioned, isomorphic application, the server side code uh, is sort of mixed with the client side code. There shouldn't be this huge uh, context switch or jump uh, for the developer, you know, whenever they need to uh, write uh, or create some features, they shouldn't have to have this huge barrier to jump across every single time when they're building these features. And very importantly, again, optimizing the human factor. You want people, you want the developers to be happy because if they're satisfied with the current code base they're dealing with, definitely they'll be able to give, uh, to create a better product overall. Okay, and again, the counterpoint to uh, the earlier problem phase, which is we want to be able to uh, embrace newer technologies, newer principles, in fact, using a framework that supports, uh, that is supported as a single page application using Next.js, being able to incorporate principles like lazy loading you know, to allow us to have that gigantic uh, shift over from a legacy Rails application over to something that was more uh, reminiscent of uh, front-end applications, performant front-end applications that you can see in today's market. And I think one of the other important points that I want to emphasize was that uh, it wasn't just about finding, you know, the justification, the small points uh, or big points, you know, towards uh, the, the problems that we identified. I think one of the other things is we actively experimented in the years before. I mean, we had this Rose application, uh, we stick with it, we tried different, like smaller solution to fix the problems that I mentioned. And along those time, along that period, we looked at uh, experimenting on other solutions. Uh, I think last year we shared about our effort in rewriting Sumpi. We changed from a, a PHP application, it was in WordPress, uh, over to a, uh, a single page application created using React Router. And then around a year before, a year and a half before, in fact, well, Half a year after we did our project with Sumpi, uh, our manager came up with the idea that you know next year seems to be uh, uh, picking up traction. A lot of companies are using it. Let's try it for another small project on the side. Uh, and then the developer feedback seems to be pretty positive about the uh, writing uh, the application using Next.js. So this sort of helped to push the direction you know, towards, okay, we want to do this migration. We found a lot of success with this uh, different frameworks. Let's try to use these frameworks to solve the problem that we see over here. And this is something I also would encourage uh, within your own organization or within your own teams. Uh, if you can afford to uh, experiment with smaller projects, you want to do that you know, before you make the big decision, this huge leap to do the migration. Okay, so I hope I've sort of convinced you on why, uh, you know, what are our pain points and you know, why we had to go with a solution of migration. Uh, I think I wouldn't just want to end that off uh, in that sense, like at a very high level, uh, but I want to talk about uh, some of the interesting things that I encountered you know, along the lines of uh, migrating from a Rails application to Node. 
and this one is more on the backend slash DevOps portion. Uh, again, the this is not a silver bullet. I think some of the well, okay, I'll, I'll just jump to the solution, uh, or not solution, the problems, and let you guys see what it is. Okay, so first off, I just want to mention, okay, so now that we've decided uh, on the approach to do the migration, uh, where do you start first? Uh, of course, you must always go back to your team, uh, get everyone in the same room. That's what we did at the start. Uh, try to see what's everyone's opinion on how we can do this. And the final decision uh, that was made by our manager at the end was uh, let's support both applications together at the same time. You know, instead of just doing uh, this migration in one big leap, where you take all the uh, rendered uh, the products, the features within the Rails application over to the Node application, why not support both the Rails application and the Node uh, application at the same time and look at slowly moving the features across? Okay, so that in some sense, we can also uh, seek to sort of understand with analytics whether the Node application is actually performing better versus the Rails application. Okay, and to do this, the you can use what is called uh, the, like, at the point of time when we did this, the name of, or rather the methodology itself wasn't actually known to us, uh, but this was something that I picked up recently, uh, which I found that actually, yeah, this was exactly what we did, uh, which I believe this is uh, coined by Martin Fowler, which is the Strangler pattern, uh, where you're looking at, you know, in terms of doing a migration, supporting both the legacy as well as the new application. And in our case, you can see over here, the legacy application is referring to a Rails application, the new application itself is our node application. So early on, we'll be looking at moving parts or small portions of the uh, features or pages over to the new application. And over time, that will become, uh, that amount will increase more and more. And eventually, you should get the uh, your node application where you have taken over all the new features. And then you can look at just removing the any uh, other resources that you have put in to maintain you know, this entire pattern. Okay, so this is a, a very high level uh, description on how our migration plan. Uh, okay, so let's touch on, on the, the, some of the core details and maybe some interesting points. Uh, okay, so just to recap a bit on the previous slide, uh, the idea that we are going with the strangler pattern uh, at the core itself is referring to migration by page or feature. So at the start, we look at migrating our home page first. And currently, we are looking at migrating a bunch of uh, other pages as well. So we're looking at it moving as either a single page or a group of uh, pages uh, that's, that's sort of uh, the same feature, okay? And actually, I want to emphasize that there isn't, I wouldn't say there is a, uh, again, no silver bullet, like if you want to migrate it in a different way, uh, definitely there's definitely other approaches to this. Okay, so some of the interesting uh, issues that I helped to resolve, in fact, what uh, we found to be blockers early on when we did this migration between the Rails to the Node application uh, were these few points. So first thing is that we mentioned that we want to support this uh, strangler pattern. You need to have both uh, server side uh, servers, uh, Rails server and your Node server to run uh, at the same time. And they must be behind one single IP because uh, for Vicky.com, you know, that has to be resolved to a single IP address and you must use some form of methodology to support both servers behind this one single IP address. So that's our, that was our first problem. Uh, second problem is about uh, cost application, cross application issues. Uh, the way I, okay, so now that I'm saying it, it doesn't sound very complicated, but uh, as I go into it deeper uh, later, you'll see like why this is actually a, a larger issue. Uh, and then, yeah, some workflow replacements. So in our Rails application, we had uh, part of our workflow where we looked at using some scripts to help us push our translations to our uh, translation platform. And, you know, that was in using rig files in uh, Rails. How do we translate that to a node service instead? Okay, so let's try to answer the first question first. How do you support both servers uh, from the same IP address uh, with the same host name? Okay, so since we are looking at moving over to a node application, I mean, immediately we could just use our node application as a proxy as well. And for those who might not know what I meant by this, essentially what I'm uh, hinting at is using your node uh, server as a reverse proxy. So what happens is that for the host name of uh, Vicky.com, you just need to make sure that it resolves the, the IP address fronted by your node application. And basically what you do after that is uh, you just need to make sure that you 
capture the routes that you want to support on your node application, and then the fallback, which is for every single route, push it over or proxy it over to your real server. If you want to do that in a node application, so this is uh, an example I got from the Stack Overflow uh, solution. Uh, I mean, if you want to use it in the Express, with the Express framework, it works as well. Uh, the idea is very simple. You essentially just want to use the HTTP library, create a request object, uh, and then pipe the uh, proxy your request over to your real server, and basically just pipe the response from the proxy server back to your current response uh, for your current request that you're proxying. Okay. So, th but this one, creating your own solution itself might be a bit complicated. Uh, I mean, especially because you are sort of uh, clumping with the rest of your other routes uh, in your application. Uh, maybe let's say, uh, I mean, is there a library that can do something like this? If you look around, there's actually a node module that you can use. So instead of creating the proxy uh, code yourself, you can just use this library called node HTTP proxy. Okay, so examining this solution, uh, it does solve the problem. But at the earlier part when we first thought about this, I mean, it looks like a suitable solution. But uh, looking at it from the long term, uh, we felt that it wasn't a very good solution, even though you know this was something that we can couple within our node uh, server. Uh, but the idea is that the, we're coupling uh, two different purposes together. Uh, instead of just focusing on the one node application, which is only supposed to s support the features that we, that we have migrated onto, we have covered additional purposes on it. Uh, and this also conflicts with part of our say is the Next.js uh, framework where, I mean, they allow you to create that custom server.js, uh, but there's also like a sort of a preferable way where you can choose to do without that altogether. And to convince you with like on this coupling situation, right, the idea here is this, you no, know, all you need is for your node server to go down and all your proxy requests that are currently uh, in the air or uh, currently in the wire or uh, Let's say, yeah, the moment your node server crash, your real uh, service is sort of uncontactable as well because your node server is essentially your reverse proxy here. Uh, and then for those who have uh, coded in uh, JavaScript, you know that like for a node server, all you need is one single error for that single process application to crash. So that might not be the most ideal situation. I mean, if we need to deploy a new node application where uh, let's say we're experimenting on something, uh, that might actually impact our real application uh, in different ways that we might not expect. Okay, so looking at our original solution, we started thinking, is there a different or better way to do this? Okay, so why not instead of using your node application as a, uh, your node server as a proxy, a reverse proxy, why not just implement your own uh, reverse proxy on top of your two different uh, servers that you are trying to support? So essentially, you just need to make sure that your proxy, okay, over here I wrote that uh, we use an Nginx proxy, but in fact, you can just use anything uh, that you want as long as it suits the, uh, fits the purpose over here. Okay, so with a single host name, uh, make sure that it resolves to the IP addresses fronted by this proxy. And then in the proxy itself, you can set in certain rules to direct to either the rules or the node application. Okay, so the methodology for this is very simple. You just need to make sure you set the rules uh, for this proxy passing to work. And these rules itself are essentially the same thing I mentioned earlier on, the match paths. So for every route that you migrate over to, let's say, Node.js, uh, your Node.js service, you can just add those routes into uh, your reverse proxy and uh, indicate to them that you want this path to actually point to uh, your Node service instead of Rails. Okay, and there's two ways of doing this. You can either do it using a white, uh, white list or black list. Uh, at this point of time, uh, what I can say is that we are actually doing it more as a whitelist because we have only migrated a few routes over. Uh, so whitelist here is referring to that uh, we just want to whitelist a couple of different paths uh, that we want to redirect to the node application. But let's say towards the point where we have migrated 90% of all our uh, paths over or features over to our node application, we might actually switch that over and turn it into a blacklist where we can say, okay, for the remaining 10% of all the routes that we, or paths that we have not migrated or features that we have not migrated, send them over to the Rails application instead. Okay, so this will help to make things more manageable as we do the migration. Okay, so that solves the problem about having two uh, different applications or servers 
uh, coexisting behind one single IP address. Okay, so to the second problem, or what I would say the more interesting problem uh, that I can share. Okay, uh, I just want to start off first by addressing the uh, third point that I mentioned earlier on, which is for workflows. If you are looking at migrating from a Rails application to a Node application, you have uh, rig files, you might just want to use the NPM run script instead. Uh, it's a very clear-cut solution. Uh, basically, your rig files are like uh, the scripts that you can run on your command line. Uh, NPM run scripts are essentially the same thing. Okay, so towards the, uh, what I'll say is, uh, again, something that I'm very excited to share, which is like sort of the interesting problem, one of the interesting problems that we faced when we did the migration, as well as it was kind of a big blocker uh, that was sort of blocking us from actually doing the migration altogether. Uh, and let me explain more about this. Okay, so the problem statement is essentially this. We have our original Rails application. We allow users to log in using that Rails application. And you know, with the login action, you have your user sessions. Now, how do you be able, how are you able to communicate this session over to your other node application? You know, how can you allow this user session to coexist within two uh, servers at the same time? Uh, I think for some of us, the solution might be quite obvious uh, if you are already familiar with uh, certain load balancing concepts uh, or supporting uh, the user sessions across, let's say, multiple regions, different classes of your uh, supporting the same server, where you just need to make sure that uh, rather one solution is actually to uh, ensure that the session is stored on the client side using cookies. So what, you, what happens here is that you will use the browsers as a common interface. Uh, the set cookie header will always be uh, written you know, after you do the login or if there's any changes made uh, on any path on your real service. And then you can uh, use this same cookie uh, when you are trying to hit the same uh, or different paths in your node application. And because both applications are using the same host name, uh, your browser will uh, intuitively send this package over to both services. Okay, so for those who might not know or uh, not in the know regarding cookies, basically if you go to your, uh, let's say if you're using uh, Chrome or actually any browsers, uh, you open your developer console, you should see uh, under the uh, cookies, uh, search for the cookies menu, you should be able to find like a table where you can search for your different cookies. Uh, and what you have could be something like this, you know, you, you have like the name of some of the cookies, you have some values that they are storing in your browser uh, that they can use to send uh, if the host name matches uh, for the current uh, site that you're on. Okay, so that sounds like a very simple solution. So what's so complex about that? Uh, okay, so let's try and think, uh, or rather walk towards uh, that complicated portion I'm hinting towards. Okay, so firstly, let's try to answer the question. So in Rails, we have our cookie stores that helps you create your uh, cookies uh, that you can send back, uh, cookies for the sessions that you can send to the uh, browser. Uh, how about in Node, how do you do that? I think very clear cut, some of us may already know about this, which is to use libraries like a cookie session to help you create that uh, user session. Okay, but here's where the situation spirals down to a tailspin, which is that if you look at using libraries that, uh, like for example, like cookie session, right? The issue is that they only sign the session value. But you know, like what was exactly the problem about that? Okay, if you look at the Rails application, in our case specifically, a Rails 4 application, the cookie session is both encrypted and signed. So you, you can already see from here that there's a big problem. You have a Rails application that encrypts and signs a cookie, pass it to a browser. You know, let's say if you use the browser and try to hit the node application, your node application, let's say if you're using something like the cookie session, they would have no idea on how to pass that, that cookie value because it's encrypted you know, using some logic within the Rails application. So how exactly, do you, how exactly can you solve this problem? Okay, can we find some other libraries to solve this problem? Uh, Turns out you can, but this was something that we actually didn't went with. So there's actually this library called Rails Session Decoder. Uh, there's actually one single maintainer for this library. And the scary part about this is that uh, there's actually not much people maintaining it. Uh, and again, because it was only uh, maintained by one single person, there's not much people using it. Uh, essentially, what this would mean is that if we want to use this for a flagship product, you know, for Viki.com, we need to actually get people to at least audit the solution and make sure it works. But if you're going to go to the distance of you know checking other people's code, right? Uh, why not we write that solution instead? And actually, that was what we went with. It's a bit of a nuclear option, but it has worked for us pretty well. 
So in the end, what we figure out was, why not we just go to the Rails, uh, I mean, the Rails application itself, in fact, uh, sorry, the Rails uh, code itself is open source. You can actually go to GitHub and look at the code. Uh, so we took reference from both uh, the open source library as well as the previous page, that, uh, that the library that what you saw. Uh, we used both as inspiration to create uh, a library that we can maintain you know, within our own company. Okay, and this worked out pretty well because we we're able to create the equivalent uh, encryption, decryption, along with signing uh, that we can bundle with together in our node application. Okay, so essentially this is what we ended off in the end. Uh, it's actually very simple. If you are looking at doing something similar to this, uh, 1,200 lines, this was around two days worth of work, maybe one additional day worth of researching to make it work. Yeah. And uh, okay, before I end off, I just want to mention like for those, uh, if, if you have a Rails application, you're looking at moving it uh, over to Node, uh, one thing I'll mention is if you are on the version before Rails 4, like Rails 3 or Rails 2, uh, what are you waiting for? You should update. There's probably a lot of security flaws there. If you are on Rails 4, uh, you might want to look at upgrading to Rails 4.1 first. Uh, because what happened is that before Rails 4.1, they actually used a different way of serializing the uh, user session. It was actually not in JSON before. But approaching 4.1, they changed it to a hybrid approach. Or not a hybrid approach, but uh, we, it's a, it was a configuration where you can choose between the old serialization pattern and the new, uh, the JSON serialization. And you can also choose a option called hybrid, which is essentially uh, if you have sessions uh, who are using the old serialization pattern, after hitting your website for one time, they, the uh, Rails 4.1 itself, uh, if you set the option, they will convert it to the JSON serialization. Uh, and then it, this will allow you to be able to, let's say you can set it there for maybe three to four weeks. And once you have seen from analytics that, uh, let's say 99% of your user sessions have been converted over to using JSON, uh, then from that point on, you can actually look at rolling out your node application uh, with the encryption decryption logic to be able to uh, read that JSON uh, structure as well, that, that user object from the cookies. Okay, so yeah, essentially it's something like this uh, when you're configuring in Rails. Uh, I guess other tips, we actually went a bit wild with the library that we wrote uh, because we in our company, we still had people who wrote, uh, who, who are still developing in Rails. Uh, and one of our pain points was actually not being able to debug uh, from our, or rather it wasn't very easy to uh, decrypt your user sessions uh, when you are running in production. So we decided why not we just create uh, something uh, additional, you know, since we already have the decryption encryption logic, we wrote it as a standalone library. Let's use the uh, NPM, uh, create it as an NPM binary and allow anyone to just come in, install and use it for debugging both the node as well as the uh, their Rails application. Okay, so I'm reaching the end. So I guess the conclusion I have here is that I'm actually leaving you with kind of the very ambiguous state, uh, whether you should do the migration or not. I think that in the end lies with the use case in your company, but I hope I've shined some light into whether you should do so, as well as some of the pain points, uh, like this user session thing was bugging us at the start, you know, when we discovered it, but we managed to solve it at the end. Uh, but I think it's kind of like a romantic statement that I want to state, uh, or maybe I guess I want to share is, like you, even within this migration, you want to look at making long-term solutions. Uh, but I think it's important to also be self-conscious and like see that actually this thing probably won't last forever. I mean, if you look at a Rails application, we uh, it was likely created with that mentality, but in the end, uh, it had to be migrated. Uh, likely, you know, currently what we are doing, a few years later, there'll be a newer piece of technology, maybe we'll have to do a migration again. But having said that, the decisions made by the earlier uh, creators of the Rails application actually did it quite well, where we could make it last for seven years. You know, seven years is an incredibly long time. And this is something of inspiration. That's something that we can use uh, towards, you know, now that we're doing our migration, having it survive for maybe seven years or more in the future. Uh, yeah, so with that, I've come to the end. Uh, if you guys are interested in reaching out to me, there's this few links over here and that's it. Thanks for listening. So I guess I'll take some questions.
Okay, so I think there is one question regarding uh, rationale and decision to migrate. Uh, have do you have any thoughts on Hey.com and how they went for the almost no GS route? I have not seen this before, so I'm gonna take a quick look at that. Uh, okay, let me stop sharing my screen. But I'm gonna take a quick look at that and uh, see if I can answer this directly. Um, in the meantime, does anyone know when you have lots of microservices, you might need to, uh, they might need to know who the user is. Each service might need to know. Um, in those kind of architectures, how do they, how does each service uh, find out who the user is? I wonder if anyone uh, in our community has, has seen that in operation. Are you referring to something like a tracing solution? Like uh... tracing, um, I I think it's uh, well, it's more like because you had the the Redis and oh, sorry, not the Redis. You had um, Ruby on Rails and Node, and they both needed to know who the user was. And I was thinking there must be um, lots of companies in the wild who also need to have this problem. And especially if they have lots of little microservices, they must all, all of those services, or many of them, will want to know who the user is um, for you know access rights. And I wonder how they do it. And I'm not sure if uh, maybe a company I worked for in the past uses used Redis to do that kind of stuff. Um, I'm not sure. I might be wrong about that. Or maybe other people have an idea. Yeah, so a separate authentication service so it would be a third a third a third part of your system that's the kind of thing i'm imagining so you have node rails and then an authentication service that they both talk to that's maybe another option somebody says if you use kubernetes you can run an authentication service as a sidecar Somebody has said you can use a saga pattern with an orchestrator. How are you doing on uh, your hey.com research? Um, looking at it now. I think it probably would be better if I can answer this offline after looking at it. Okay. Do we have any other questions from people? I liked your diagram of the strangler pattern. It made it very clear. Thanks. I think I got it from some other site, yeah. Okay, um, so, okay, uh, if you have any more questions, if people have any more questions, how should they contact you? Uh, I think 
on LinkedIn directly. That should work. Okay, LinkedIn. Wei Yuan Liu, is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Akshata's talk about uh, performance in React. Yep, should I, let me share my screen. Uh, are you able to see it? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. So, hey everyone, thanks for sticking around for the last talk of this evening. And today we'll be reacting faster by building for performance in React. So firstly, a bit about myself. My name is Akshata. I'm a full stack engineer at Wiki, same company as we are before me. And before Wiki, I did research at NUS for three years. And a long time back, I was actually an architect for buildings. But then I realized that my passion was coding. I went on to free code, free code camp, taught myself how to code, and switched to doing software full time. So performance. Why performance? Well. Obviously, nobody likes a slow website. But to make it official, faster websites means better user experience. Better user experience means happier customers. And happier customers means more money. And I don't need to ask if people like money. So there's an unquestionable correlation between web performance and revenue. And to put that into perspective, I have this great visualization from DeckSecure.com, which says that a site that makes 100K a day could potentially lose 2.5 million in a year by just a one second delay in their page load time. To re-emphasize this further, Google actually has an impact calculator. And this provides a direct conversion from site performance to financial impact that you might bear. So now that we've established the importance of having a fast website for our paychecks, what do we do about it? Well, mostly nothing, because most of us would be using a framework like React, which is fast by default. And everything in life is nice. Everything will be fast. Your app is as smooth as this Ferrari, till it's not. Please, Vicky, try to fix issues with the chat lag time tomorrow. You get this feedback from a user, and this is you as the developer praying to React gods. So for a flashback and a little bit more context, we at Wiki launched a new feature called Watch Party a couple of weeks back. And a Watch Party is a shared co-viewing experience, something like YouTube Live, where people come together to watch K-drama in real time and share their passion, connect with each other over live chat. This is what it looks like. There's a video playing on the left. There's a live chat on the right. And the UI is simple, but there's a lot going on in terms of processing on this page. So as you can see, there's a video playing. In a watch party, there could be 800 to 1,400 users all chatting concurrently. Sometimes the message frequency goes up to even 5 per second. And in a watch party that's about an hour and a half long, there may be 10,000 messages, if not more. The feedback that we saw previously was for the chat feature on this page. So we embarked on this journey to try and optimize our watch party. The first thing was figuring out the tools. And the first tool is the performance tab that, that I'm sure all of us have seen in the Chrome Dev tools. And the next one is the React developer tools, which is available as a Chrome extension. Once you install it, it adds a components tab and a profiler tab to your Chrome DevTools. Now, armed with these tools, we'll go out hunting. What are we looking for? So the first pit stop is the performance tab. And you start recording your questionable activity, which in my case was typing a chat message and sending it out. And one thing to remember is to throttle your CPU. 4x slowdown is usually recommended because your users might have a slower device than you do as a developer. Once you've recorded an activity, your uh, profile will be generated with a ton of data, something, that, uh, something like this that you see here. 
And what you want to look for are red areas in this profile. So let's go through one of the important red areas here, which is in the frame rate graph. So what's the frame rate? The frame rate is basically how many times the browser is refreshing your view per second. And that happens usually 60 times. So 60 FPS is the normal frame rate. And in the ideal world, you would keep it at 60 FPS. But if you have long running JavaScript, this frame rate is going to dip. And when it does, it's going to affect the user experience negatively. And Chrome DevTools is smart enough to figure out when this FPS has dipped below a certain threshold. And that's when it starts to put in these red marks in your frame rate graph to show you, uh, to basically alert you that this might be a, these might be areas where your performance is suffering. So to give you, to alarm you a bit more, uh, 60 FPS means JavaScript actually has 16.6 .6 milliseconds to run per frame. And actually, there's overhead, there's browser overhead every time the frame is generated. So this number in reality is probably 10 milliseconds that your JavaScript has to run. Now that we have an idea about this, let's go explore the React part of things. So in the React Dev Tools, our first pit stop is the Components tab. And in the Components tab, there's this really cool highlighting feature that you can turn on. And once you do that, you and go to a website that's running React, when you interact with the website, it's actually going to highlight all the components that are re-rendering while you interact with the website. Uh, what you want to look for during this is any unnecessary re-renders. So if you're interacting with a small part of the website and there's something else somewhere that's re-rendering, that's maybe an area that you can look at to optimize. The next tab is the profiler tab. It works similar to the performance tab where you're going to record an activity. And what it gives you are two graphs. One of them is the flame graph, where it gives you a hierarchical uh, a hierarchical graph of all your components. The length of the component is based off the duration that it took to render in a base in, in a base metric. And the more important thing here is the color. Because the color represents whether this component took a longer time to render or rendered faster than the previous render. So you want your component to always render faster than the first time when it rendered, right? So if it's green or bluish green, like it's shown here, we are safe. But if you go into the rank chart, you see that I have a component, a component that's yellow, which means that that component is taking significantly longer to render than the previous time. The rank chart is slightly different from the flame, flame graph in the sense that it organizes your components uh, in decreasing order of the render duration that they took. So. We've gone through the tools. We now have our goals. Basically, we want no reds in our performance report, performance tab report, and we want everything blue and green in our React profiler dev reports. How do we get to that? So everything is about avoiding extra work. And in context of React, that means avoid extra reconciliation. And what's reconciliation? So those of us who work in React, we know that React actually generates works of a virtual DOM. And what it's doing is that every time you have a component, it calls the render function for that component, which generates a tree. It takes the older tree that it has for the component, compares it to this new tree, which is called diffing. And then if the component change, changes, changed, only then does it go in to uh, commit that to the DOM. And it does this process for all its children also. It recurses on the children of this render of this changed component. So the, the takeaway from this is there are two costs to React. One is rendering, the other is committing. Committing is changing the DOM, which React is smart about. It only change updates the DOM if something changes. But rendering is when React goes and calls the render function for all of these changed components to try and diff out the trees. And this is where we can extract extra, extra performance optimizations when you're working with React. So let's go on to the first main idea, which is to co-locate state. 
and the idea is to push down this reconciliation this comparing of trees as further down into the tree as possible to give you an example i have this uh, re i have this chat component here which was the initial write of that and if you see when i'm typing something the whole chat component is re-rendering this is because when i type something i'm updating the state for the entire chat component and react is trying to reconcile everything that exists inside it now i went ahead and refactored this to extra to extract only the input into its own component that has its own state and now when i type only that chat input changes what does it mean in terms of performance well initially when i was chatting it was 30 31.6 milliseconds to render this whole thing and then after my refactor it went down to 1.5 milliseconds as render duration it's pretty good let's explore the next peak that we find and the next peak that i had was when the chat the a newly sent chat message was being inserted into all of the chat messages array that i had and i'm going to introduce my second idea here which is memoization Memo memoization is a fancy word for caching and to look at uh, let's look at the react uh, render tree again so say c1 component changes what react is going to do is it's going to go down to c2 and c3 call the render functions for those components and try to diff their trees out to see if something changed in the dom but react also provides a should component update life cycle method and if you return false from that react knows that it doesn't need to reconcile that component and skips that part of the tree so over here c2 is returning false for should component update means react will never go down to c4 and c5 to try and reconcile it c3 is saying true for should component update so it comes down to c6 and uh, tries to reconcile the tree which is correct because there was a dom update there c7 returns false so it escapes from reconciling there and c8 is a wasted render because even though react tried to reconcile the tree there were no dom dom updates so he could have skipped that how do you do this there is something called react memo and you can wrap your component with react memo give it an optional function that takes in the previous props and the next props you can add conditional logic here to return a boolean value to tell react whether to reconcile this component or not if you don't pass in this optional function then react does a shallow compare between the props and if it's uh, if the props haven't changed react won't re-render or reconcile this component one thing to remember here is referential equality so if you have inline functions as props or inline objects those on every renders will be recreated means your props will always be different means this react memo won't work for components like that so the first uh, screenshot here is when the chat messages was trying to render all the internal children underneath it and the second one is when i memoized out all the chat messages inside in terms of time taken initially it was taking 34.2 milliseconds and after the refact after memoization it took only 4.2 milliseconds as render duration let's come on to the third idea now and the third idea is virtualization which is recycling the dom and if you guys remember i talked about the number of messages that this chat has and sometimes it goes up to more than 10000 messages so virtualization is a method in which you don't put all of those elements into the dom you only put those elements into the dom that are visible to your user so you have this window and as this window goes up and down your list only those elements that are visible to the user get inserted into the dom and the dom recycles in a way to do this uh, there are already packages that exist like react window or react virtualized both of them are written by the same guy who's also a core developer uh, core developer for react at facebook and the gains from this is basically we had 10000 messages but uh, logically we were storing only 2000 as part of history and now that now we could get these 2000 dom nodes 
uh, down to 30 DOM nodes by using this uh, virtualization method. So in summary, co-locate state, memoize aggressively, use virtualization. But I want to add a disclaimer here. Don't optimize prematurely. Like I've mentioned before, React is a fast framework on its own. So if you try to optimize prematurely, you might be introducing unexpected behavior or bugs that might be difficult to track down later by other developers. So it's always better to wait for a performance glitch before you start using these strategies, then go back, measure it, use the strategy and measure it again to see what's happening in the big picture. Here's a list of resources. If somebody wants to dig down deeper, it's mostly React.js performance docs and uh, Ken C. Dodd's blog. And thank you, and I'll be happy to take any questions if there are any. Thank you, Akshata. I'm sure there will be some questions. Um, I am wondering how React Window and React Virtualized work uh, with the height of elements. Do they automatically, do they, do they do it all automatically or do we need to give them some help? Um, dealing with the height of elements. So if your height is fixed, then it handles it okay. But uh, for my case, the height wasn't. So they do uh, React virtualized, which is the old one. That handles it okay with HOCs, like Autosizer. And that HOC takes in your element, figures out the row height for that, and passes it down. You need to, yeah, if, if your high, row height is dynamic, you need to add extra stuff to figure that out and pass it down. Extra okay. stuff in the extra HOCs. But it can help with that, with these HOCs. Yeah, yeah. Because for me, in my chat things, the, I, I can't, I don't have a determined row height, right? So it has to be dependent mm -hmm. on the content. Mm -hmm. So I have to wrap each of those with that auto size or row height calculator and then use the React render package. Okay, thank you. Mm, pre, uh, should, I, should I just answer the questions? And yes, please go ahead. So the pre-optimization point, it didn't really happen to me, but uh, most of the blogs that I read uh, that it was a disclaimer in everything, and I I guess I understand why because when you memoize something, you're basically saying, don't reconcile it unless the props changes. So say you've memoized something and another developer comes in and uh, doesn't realize that it's only based on the props, there might be there might be issues in tracking down what's happening, right? I guess that was the point why everywhere there was a disclaimer. Okay, variable heights are also supported in React window. Yep. So one of the packages uh, that's that's uh, that's the variable list height, but for variable row height, you still need to wrap it into an H with with an HOC as. Uh, the HOC captures the height and passes it to the, the, the library, the virtualization window library. It's it's the same. Uh, the The whole methodology is mentioned in their docs. I think it's the same. Um, it's written by the same guy. I can provide a link to the slides um, in the top.js issue, maybe? Yes, please. Yes, do that. Okay. And we may eventually add them to the meetup 
but yes, the, the GitHub is the best place. Okay, got it. I think if if people want to unmute now, they're welcome to if they want to ask questions. I think one reason you don't want to memoize, one basic reason you don't want to memoize all your components is if you're doing something like animation and the component is changing every time anyway, then comparing the props is just wasting more CPU and it will yeah. slow down your animation. Yeah, yeah. But I think there's probably lots of other reasons. So uh, we should probably give this blog post a read. Okay, Akshata, thank you very much for your presentation. Very interesting. Okay, so now we're going to move to open announcements, or we can just open up for chat if you like. But um, if anyone wants to announce anything, please... Um, yeah, unmute yourself and and talk to us. So this announcement about uh, something you've learned recently, um, okay. anything you've you've built, uh, or jobs you want, uh, jobs you're of people you're looking for. Yes, sorry, please go ahead. Someone say something just now. Um, if you're looking for a job, if you're looking to hire people or anything like this at all, or if you even want to promote any conference, virtual conferences that you saw you thought was pretty cool. Um, I mean, you can just feel free to do like unmute and chat. You're all on by default muted, so like please unmute. No? I don't really have a question. Uh, it's more of like advice uh, that I like to ask around. So I'm actually mm -hmm. with the same company for about two years now, and I'm on a. I'm still rather happy with the project that I'm on. I'm quite happy with it. Uh, but the problem is the project is actually using a rather old stack. Uh, I'm still using Angular JS, so Angular version mm -hmm. one. Um, just and like now is not really a good period to like try to change the job just to get on a new project, I feel. So like I mean and I realized that recruiter that have reached out to me, uh they're very particular about like if let's say they want a Python developer, they want a Python developer, full stop. Um they don't care about how willing, how, how easy, I mean, to a developer perspective, to be honest, it felt like it is quite easy to jump from a language to a language. But mm -hmm. to the hiring side, uh, it's not really the case. So like, how do I, just wanted to ask like, how do I actually stay at my current role, but at the same time, get exposure to another platform, another language, another framework? I mean, building personal project is still quite a far way from like, say, writing production ready code. Yeah, so just wonder what's, a, what's other people thought on that. On point two, I think a lot of other more qualified people can respond. But on point one about talking to recruiters, frankly, recruiters just do keyword mapping. So like if you can manage to talk to hiring managers or developers that are already in the company, I think they're a lot more open to knowing that other developers can easily learn new concepts and not have to like match the resume word for word. Um, so it's probably uh, uh, like a little blockage because you're talking to recruiters who actually, a lot of them don't fully comprehend what they're recruiting for. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of great ones, but like to be honest, the, the, there are a lot that think that, okay, X is X, you know, like I need to match keyword for keyword to present to my clients the perfect uh, candidate. So, 
personally, I would try to talk to someone who's already in engineering inside. My personal opinion. Yeah, thank you. Apart from personal projects, you could try and get involved with an open source project which has a, a running website um, because then you're maybe moving up into a slightly more production uh, level. And then you could say on your CV, I've helped to maintain this Python-based website for a year or two. And you could give a link to it and show it running. Yep. Thank you. And, and also, if you're working with a team that way, you can maybe get some feedback to improve your code, which you don't get working on your own on a personal project. Uh, hi, I have a question. So uh, I'm fairly new to programming, and I'm like still learning a lot, like on the start. Uh, I just wanted to ask, like, what are the expectations of junior developers, like, in 2020 currently? This is an open mic, by the way. So, like, everybody can please unmute, and then you can, like, give your say. If you have hired junior developers, we have mentored junior developers, like, like, feel free to just mention, like, personally, you prefer working with a developer who show this kind of traits or that kind of stuff. Like, this is open mic, it's open discussion, it's not a QA. and a we, we did hire an open developer, uh, a junior developer, um, a couple of months ago, and uh, we, we saw a few candidates, um, we ended up hiring a guy who had um, not, I think he'd done one programming job, but he had tried a few different things. He'd done a few different hobby projects and they were up on GitHub. So we could go and have a look and see, you know, the sort of the quality of his code. And um, so, yeah, I think it's good to have a little portfolio of projects you've done. Um, Cause, and that, that way we could see that he had some experience in React and he had done some reading about this and that. Um, so yeah, I guess one bit of advice would be anything you do look into and learn about, upload it and show it off. Um, yeah, build your portfolio. Thank you. No one else has any point to add? Another How about Richard? No? He had a team, no? I guess everyone's too shy. <laughs> that question? Another consideration is um, uh, is it, are you someone that's good to work with? Um, that was another uh, thing we, we were looking at. And um, that can just be a kind of personal thing. Um, with, uh, it, are you a culture fit for the team? But in general, I think it means being open to, um, uh, yeah, to learning and to collaborating and uh, good communication. It's an, another important factor which is often forgotten with programming, but it's, it's pretty important. Um, maybe I can add something on to that. So for me, I've mentored a few juniors in the past. And I feel that uh, one trait that I really uh, makes me enjoy mentoring them is if they have the willingness to learn and they take initiative. So basically try to unblock yourself first before you proceed to approach your seniors to help with you. Because when you try to unblock yourself, sometimes... Uh, it helps to you to build up like your debugging skills and critical thinking, which I think is a really important role in this, a uh, really important trait in this role. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
maybe I can add like another, I guess it's a little bit of a controversial point. Uh, but I thought somewhat useful uh, when someone shared this with me. Uh, maybe you can search up on this thing called the Dunning-Kruger's curve. Uh, it's actually the idea like when, when I was introduced to this was to uh, be sort of self-aware on like sort of where you are on the curve and uh, like I think because if you look at part of the curve, uh, it goes up to a very high peak at the start and then uh, goes down as you start realizing that you know there's so much more that you have to learn. So it's it's kind of like a reflection that yeah because there's so much things to learn, always be open to learn uh, from your other colleagues and the people around you. Right, thank you for the input. Uh, going back to the first question, I did like the suggestion made in one of the talks that when you want to try out a new technology, a new language, uh, you do that in a small project, and um, and then you can assess without uh, without too much risk because it's only a small thing. Um, it's a good way to to to, to learn something new. We had that at my previous uh, place. We uh, we had lots of small projects coming through, and each project we would decide to try out one new technology. Sometimes two, but usually one was better. And then when that project was finished and the new one was starting, we would decide whether to keep that new technology or go back to what we were using before. Um. Maybe speaking on personal experience, I think one of the earliest things I learned was debugging. Uh, and I mean, related to Crystal's point, like uh, I found debugging ex the, as a skill extremely, extremely helpful in the beginning. It's like you learn a lot of things and then you can unblock yourself and it's, it's so important. I think a problem that juniors face quite often is they want to ask Google for help, but they don't know the keywords to use. Um, Good point. Yeah. I don't know the solution to that problem. But help maybe Google. That, yeah, maybe when a, a junior asks the question, uh, the answer is maybe not to give them the answer, but you just say, these are the keywords you need. That's all they need, perhaps, just to unblock them. It's uh, a, a nudge in the right direction. Yeah, like when I started my programming journey, what I realized is that I learned to learn a lot. You know, it's like it's like you have to, like even when you are in like what they call the tutorial hell in some sense, you still gotta like you know figure out the problem. It's like a every single step along, you gotta be like like self sufficient to like find solutions. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's why you're talking. Yeah. It's good to Google something first before bothering the seniors, but sometimes, um, yeah, it's also, uh, you don't want to waste time getting, if you're really stuck, then, um, yeah, don't waste time. Get, get, get a little bit of help. And sometimes you only need a little nudge. Maybe I could share my experience. So I, my experience about one year plus back when I went from tutorial health to actually starting on a, a, a job as a junior dev, what I find from a personal experience is that uh, first you need to be familiar with your tool. So, I mean, uh, the tool set in the company is very different from the tool set that you are on a personal level. And sometimes you don't really have a choice. So you might be fixed to a certain ID, good or bad. You need to know how to use it. So on the junior level, you were always, the most convenient way of debugging is like console lock. Uh, or system out cleaning. But when you move to a permanent role, in that sense, there are more useful debugging tools. So you can set breakpoint, etc. Uh, and if you're talking about front end, uh, there are even more 
tools that you can use. For example, React, you have various uh, components, add-ons, uh, Redux, inspections kind of tool. So you need, uh, it will help you be more productive if you know how to use this tool. And the other thing that I noticed that the biggest difference is really about uh, skill. So when you work, you play around your own project, you're always looking at about maybe 6, 20, 30 files. When you move out to production, you're looking at, I don't know, I think my current project have like 20,000 files. Uh, I can't really remember how many lines of code there are. But like, uh, so one thing that shocked me is that uh, how people navigate around the code base a lot is they actually just do control shift F and really just do a word search. So, uh, but it ended up to be quite a useful way of uh, looking around code. Then if you're talking about like trying to get a job, uh, I, I sit on the other side of the table in terms of like helping the hiring manager. Uh, what we usually try to look out for is someone who we were, one of the questions that I found quite useful is that uh, asking them about their previous project, big or small, and sharing about the project to them. So usually, uh, just by the person talking about project, you can tell whether that person is uh, someone who is willing to learn and someone who realized that at that point in time, he might not make the best choice and he's receptive to criticism. So uh, I think that aspect is actually quite important in a team setting. So yeah, just my humble opinion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. I, I wanted to add on to uh, in house point that like searching through a very, very large application code base um, and, and like keyword searching, I think, uh, uh, I don't know how you learn this skill other than through work experience is knowing what to search for. I think this applies not just like to a, a, a large code base, but it, it, it's almost like Googling to a certain extent is that no, what you you don't know this thing, but like keyword searching. This so I I feel it does come from a bit of experience. Um. Uh, in in terms of like, when you wanna, how do you narrow down your search through a twenty thousand file code base? I can relate to that because like I'm not working on a fairly large project. Also, it's like the word is very common. How would you narrow it down to a point where you know, you can actually find the method or find the function or find the whatever you're looking for. Um, I think this is, is one of the most useful skills you can have if you are if you're gonna be working on a on on a team on a large pro on on a large application. Uh, otherwise you just get you just get lost because you don't even know who to ask where to where to go. Um, but about the, also I wanted to chime in about the, the mentoring thing, but on the other point, from the other point of view is that like, if you end up being a mentor, I think an interesting way to look at it is that it is in your best interest to, to, for your mentee to be able to solve the problem themselves. So I think, so people might not agree with me, but I think if you go all out, into trying to get them to, to, to learn how to do it themselves, right? It, as opposed to just sort of like, oh yeah, this is, the, this is how you do it, like directly just giving it to them, right? It might take you longer upfront, but like, I, I like to assume good intent is that like, they also don't want to wholly like depend on you. Or just it's like, you 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 cite or like benefit or good intent, right? Like they also want to try to like you know do do well for themselves, right? So if 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 you if you help them to if you're able as a mentor to help them to 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 to, to learn how to do it, I I feel that that's that's a that's 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 a, that's a beneficial mentor mentee uh, 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 relationship also la. Yeah, that's it. That's it. I guess I wanted to supplement, uh, just, uh, that's a great point. Uh, so I just want to supplement. Frankly, I think in the very beginning, if you're coaching someone very junior, just personal experience again, um, it, it could be helpful in the beginning six months or so to actually just frankly tell them these are best practices, this is, this is, this. So they don't go through this like crazy search through the entire internet, not knowing what they're looking for, all that things. So you share with them your knowledge already. Uh, how to recognize patterns in a code base so they can find things easier, uh, all that kind of things. 
uh, frankly, I think like spoon feeding in the initial few months is is like super helpful um, if they are really really new. And then following that, then the ability to learn. Um, I think that's something we all find very uh, precious. But actually, I, I, I frankly think a bit of spoon feeding in the beginning is great. I don't know if anyone disagrees. Well, that makes sense if they are very, very new. Yeah, like very, very, very new. Like. Mm-hmm. I, I think my, 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 the, the, the persona I had in mind was like someone new to the team but not necessarily new to say... Yeah, definitely. definitely. I guess what I I'm, say is just super yeah. new. Yeah. I guess what I'm getting back is like a, there's like a the tutorial when it comes to working itself in the sense where that's where your mentor will help you like because from doing personal projects there wouldn't be stuff you know in like a working environment but when it comes to learning itself there, sh- there shouldn't be like too much of a, like a dependency there shouldn't be too much of a crutch you should be like you know self you should be able to learn on your own struggle on your own then maybe rely on your mentor a little bit at the end that's, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah, but I mean, uh, super, super junior people, when, I mean, personally speaking, like when you start out in the beginning, you can spend like many hours or even half a day just figuring out something which is super basic. <laughs> so like, that's another thing that, um, I, another practice I tried to take up when I was, uh, I mean, that I tried to take up was, um, if I'm stuck on something, so, so you agree with your, your mentor, if I'm stuck on something for 20 minutes and then I'll approach you, something like that. Uh, or like any arbitrary amount of time, lah. I, I ask for your opinion. Singing is a good idea. Like, not like you. You also give yourself like, if, okay, I will. I will spend. I will go all in like hundred and twenty percent of my effort to try to find the answer to this for 30, 35 minutes. Cannot there. Yeah. Uh. I think it's a yeah. good idea. Yeah, like there's a limit, lah. Because you know sometimes, especially when when you're new, you feel very paisley to ask. And actually, that's mm-hmm. terrible because that's super unproductive. Uh, yeah. I think just, just to add in something, it kind of starts uh, by sometimes it depends on the team. So, as, as a team lead, you want to give your junior or somebody new a small and manageable problem. Basically, you need to scope out the learning journey for the mentee. I mean, if, if, you, if you give somebody new, like, hey, I want you to bring up this feature that uh, is going to save us $2 million a year, sort of thing. No lah. <laughs> Setting him up for failure, right? It's, yeah. it's pretty much unmanageable. But some something small like, hey, can you solve this logging issue over there? You know, it's logging the wrong message. It gives it builds up confidence and it gives him a chance to spend a bit of time getting productive and learning how to grab the code base. Mm. So, as a junior, maybe asking the team lead for a manageable task helps a lot. Mm. Definitely agree. But back to the point of being stuck, uh, um, I find that I think it's, dif- it's it's confirmed different for everyone. But like for very GL people like me, right, I tend to, I will I will forever remember like the things that I took like the very simple thing that I took four hours to solve. What that one I did like burn into my brain for life. I like, cannot forget. Like, Hi yo, the the exasperation is very memorable. But I'm sure it's very different for other people. But like sometimes I I also wonder like. Actually, if I didn't get stuck, I won't remember it. Like, for for it won't be so memorable to me that like the next time uh, I don't even need to Google it. I know because I think I wasted four hours of my youth on this stupid like apparently very simple thing. I, I guess different for everyone uh, Yeah, like, I g- pain is the best lesson kind of thing. True. But it's a it's a balance between um, productivity and also learning something. I guess it depends on how much time the project has, lah. Yeah. Okay. So your time box. You need to judge like yourself. Yes, balance. Mm. I'm not sure if pain really helped me because I I'm definitely had some things I got really stuck on, and then I found the solution, and then in in thirty seconds I solved the problem and I forgot. Uh, but the thing that told me was when was when I met the problem many times. When I okay. met the problem yeah. three times, after after three times solving the same thing, then that was what made me remember it. Uh, I don't know if we can engineer that situation for our juniors. Maybe we, um, yeah, maybe we could set them up for failure. Uh, 
but then you know with a bit of repetition they will they will learn that lesson and then can move on to something else yeah, just that, thoughts that, anyway. that sounds like artificial pain no I guess some people learn like that <laughs> yeah no like it's yeah. Really different for everybody one like i think you don't need to engineer the pain uh bye eric i think you don't need to engineer the pain as long as you give them um many like i forgot who mentioned this now manageable uh tasks that is within their reach but also slightly beyond them then naturally we'll all learn Oh, but to this point, right, coming as the as the child of 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 teachers, like both my parents were teachers, I find that there is a as the teacher, right, there is a nuance. Like some teachers don't don't can't grasp it, and for, for some, I, those in my opinion are really good teachers. Is that they can kind of grasp because everybody has different capabilities, right? To me, the 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 the, the best teachers can. Can kind of catch like where they are where where their their students' individual threshold is. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's like, uh, maybe you got like three students, and then one student is like, you know, this person. If if they do, they put in their best, they can get a ninety five, um, and then you have another student who is like, maybe not 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 as strong. Their max their max out is like about seventy five, like. But but to, to be able to catch like where this 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 bar is, I think there's a nuance to it. So in terms of manageable tasks for on the mentor side, right, I think that also is a skill that 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 you would need to hone as a senior, like how to be a good senior, how to be a good mentor, how to be able to bring someone up, right? That's that's also a skill that, that you can kinda have to I think it's is 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 half human, half technical. So like you have to be very skilled technically to be able to gauge what task is appropriate. And then you also have a people side of it to like kind of get a feel for like where your, your, your mentee is uncomfortable but still okay or where like she, they, are, they are going to, they are, they are just going to break down because I don't know. They're like, going to break down and cry already. I know, right? Yeah, so I think actually when you bring this up, this is actually interesting. As in like both sides have have skills to hone, you know. It's, mm. it's not like a one-sided thing. Mm, definitely. So in that case, is it considered, I don't know whether is it considered like a good initiative or it's kind of cocky in the sense that you go out to your mentor and you tell him like, oh, or her, like, like this is how I learn, you know, like I, some some people, like, you know, you, you say some people need a little bit nudge, some people need a bit more feeling at the start. Is it kind of like, a, is it a good initiative or is it more like, you know, it's kind of presumptuous to like assume the team or your mentor will just adjust his piece of learning I, I method to you? I don't think it's cocky at all. I think communication is a very, very mm. critical part of the relationship. And I, I guess, that of course, there's the how you phrase how you phrase the request um, uh, or whatever, but, but I think it's a very, I think it's very good to be open. And because first of all, you need to be aware of yourself. Like you need to know, I, 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 you, you first have to have this internal conversation and like assessment of yourself. Like, oh, I think I, I, I do better when, when, when faced with X or, or, or like certain styles. Only, so after you, you, you know this, then, then to be able to communicate this to, to your senior, to your manager, to whomever. I think that that is something that we don't see a lot, but it actually helps because, at least in my opinion, I, I would appreciate it if someone told me outright direct, it's like, I, I work better this way. Like, you know, this is the style that that, 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 that suits me best, that, that, that I will be my most productive, that I'll be able to, you know, uh, 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 move faster in, when when faced with this particular communication style, for example, or like like if I'm a, like I, I I when when I'm stressed, I kind of behave X way. This kind of, like this kind of thing. If 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 you are able to articulate it clearly, right? I think that's really helpful. But not everybody can. Right? Like some people don't even know that they are like they are very stressed, but they don't know like. <laughs> People go to that. Hey, are you very stressed? Like, no, I'm not stressed at all. The, the, the time maybe you know it's a bit tricky, but but. But what you say is like, I I think it, for me I feel it's useful. I don't know what everyone else feels, you know. Cause cause to me it's communication, man, right? Mm, I mean, it depends uh, on the tone, though. It's uh, yeah. you across. Yeah. Again, I I put I I say I find like you you have to phrase it in in a 
Yeah, I think phrase, phrase it, you, you can be direct, but, 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 but respectful at the same time. I think basically the idea is propose, don't impose. So you don't impose your own learning style because you think, okay, this is the what best for me. You really propose and say like, and do it experimentally. You yeah. say like, um, by experience, I, I think, I feel like I, I learned a bit better like this. And then propose the advantage as to why you say like, uh, I think this is actually uh, a, uh, maybe something I really don't know. So if you give me a, if you have a bit of time with me, and give me a bit of baseline, for example, then I'll be able to be like a lot more productive. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the tone yeah. is very important. Like and then how, you see whether they agree. Correct. Right. Like how Min, how, 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 how Min raised it, that, that tone is more about inquiry. Mm. Like, I, this is the way that, that, that I learn best. Is it, like, so, so you're asking like, is it, is it possible for us to do it this way? Can we explore? Can we, you know, it's not like, yeah. So, Just for a while. You're, you're coming from a place of, 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 of like, you know, in, inquiry, proposal, or not, not like, I must. Ah, like that, you will follow me, yeah. Uh. And like, throw your weight around. I think most people would be open to it. I feel, I feel like, I feel like, if someone came up to me and said, um, do you think, you, you, you know, it's like, they are not, they are, they are not, they are not coming in and saying that, imposing their will on other people. Rather, they are just sharing that, okay, this is, this is, this is how I, it would be advantageous for me. So if it's, if it's okay, can we do this, right? I think most people would be receptive. Uh. I, I believe, uh, I believe. It's like the tone must be like, more like, you're trying to look for the most efficient, the most, like, you know, the, the best path, the best way around it. Not, not to like... Yeah, not because of it. you. Yeah, yeah, it's like... Yeah. Not like a, it cannot be like a very. I mean, in some sense, it's a little bit self-serving, but it's like, like you know, if it's a very amicable environment, everyone is like, "Oh, you teach me well, I learn well." Then everyone benefits. You must like form that kind of like top. Then yeah. I feel that if you can phrase it, that is for the betterment of the team. Is for the, the betterment team. of what you're trying to achieve, right? I think that will go down. That that will go down fairly okay, right? Don't forget, it helps the mentor as well because the mentor is also trying to think about how to how to get you on board as, as quick as possible. Thank you everybody for By the way, if you're not already there's a junior dev uh, where they they have uh, discussions about this kind of things too. Sorry, come again? Uh, have you have you, are you in junior dev? Uh, I don't think I'm like ready to apply yet. Yeah. But oh no, 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 it's not apply. Junior Dev is just another meetup where um, basically people starting out can get together and share common uh, things. Lah. So like the thing you said about uh, how can you manage your relationship with your own mentor, with your team, uh, what kind of things is important for beginners. Can join Junior Dev is, uh, I think there'll be a lot of very interesting content for you. It's literally junior dev. Yeah, we should right? put that on the slides. Good point. Yeah. I'm going to go now. Thanks everybody for uh, coming mm -hmm. and um, for everyone who helped to organize and join in the chat. Thanks so, for hosting. Um, yeah. 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 Yep. See Everyone's you all next good. time. Bye-bye. See everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Yes, a lot of people are still on. Bye.